and now we're going to get started properly. So uh, this talk, a cinematic experience from authentic English to imaginative listening. Um, we are, and I say we, Luke and myself, we are identical twins. Um, you can tell that by looking at us. Uh, we're brothers, we look exactly the same. So if anyone does have a problem um, telling which one is which, maybe we could, we should have done badges, Luke. What we should have done is badges so people could tell the difference between us because it's so incredibly hard to tell. Well, you do have, there is a, if you, we are labelled underneath. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Well, we've got badges. Thank God. Badges. So, um, yeah, that's the first, oh, I've got two jokes. That's the first joke. So the second one's coming in a bit. You can, you can look forward to that. Um, so as a brief introduction, we run, don't do that face, Luke. We, actually, I need to cover your face up because it's going to put me off. We run a company called Creative Listening and we're, we're authors. Um, I hope you've come across some of our work on One Stop English. Um, who we love, and thank you to them for asking us to come and talk today. Um, and we produce video and audio for education, essentially. So um, there's a few few audio series we've done with One Stop, and there's a new video series, and we've uh, we've done for them as well, uh, which we're going to briefly talk about today. So uh, we live in a digital age uh, now, and it's easier than ever to make. Uh, very high quality resources, high quality audio, high quality video. We see it in the films and the TV that we watch. We we see it in YouTube channels that we subscribe to. We see it in the Facebook videos that our our friends post up. Um, it's a it's an interesting point that YouTube is 11 years old now. It's just 11 years old. It started in 2005, which is such a tiny amount of time. And you think about how much things have changed in that amount of time and, and one example is if you look say you look at a video from 2008 2009 uh, if you look at it uh, technically you'll see that it's perhaps quite pixelated if you listen to the audio it will be a highly compressed mp3 and a bit muffled um, and if you compare that with something that's been uploaded in the last year or two you get a lot more options you can watch it at 1080p 720p is the resolution. The audio is much clearer. Um, you can hear it very well. It's, it's a better quality MP3, and um, and that's you know kind of had a huge effect. Obviously, it comes down to you know if you've got a 3G connection with your phone, if you've got a decent broadband, and that's the reason it's become so prevalent. But it does mean that things are changing a lot. Um, you know, people everywhere, everyone's got their camera phone. Well, I say everyone, but a lot of people, a lot of the world, have decent quality phones. I read an article earlier that there's an Indian company making a smartphone for three pounds. What's that? Like five dollars or something, five American dollars. So it's it's uh, it's become ubiquitous. And ubiquitous is a great word which just means everywhere. It means absolutely everywhere. Um, you know, everyone's now a producer. Everyone can make films, can record audio. Now I'm just going to put, put a slide on. Am I talking at the right speed, Luke? You're talking beautifully, James. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Sometimes I talk too fast. Um, if I am talking too fast, let me know in the chat box. So yeah, this slide, which I hope you can see on your screen, is you know it's a very visual example of how things have changed in a, such a short amount of time, with everyone with their phones recording everything now. And you know, if you go to gigs and concerts, you'll see that people are holding iPads up, recording it. You know, so I'm not even watching it sometimes. Um, so as professionals, for myself and Luke, what we need to do is um, we need to step our game up, which is uh, step one to step our game up. Me um, means we need to try harder, because uh, we need to make high quality resources that stand out from the crowd, that are really really good. They're resources that people can engage with, that they can enjoy experiencing, they can learn from, and then of course they can tweet about it and post about it or whatever. Instagram, whatever social media that they use. So, um, so that's uh, that's that first point. So, uh, a second point I'd like to talk about briefly is our production values and our approach to our work. So, um, we take the same approach uh, with audio and video, and that is to um, firstly to use industry standard. Uh, recording and equipment and production values. So when filming, we'll use contemporary filming styles and camera work. 
um, and you know make everything as pro as possible. You know, if you've got if you're a student and in your free time you're watching and listening to amazing audio and amazing video, then you need to have that in your classroom as well. Because otherwise you're just going to be, what is this? You know, this is this isn't engaging me. This isn't interesting to me. Um, and that's our kind of our overriding principle, which uh, we always come back to, um, is in everything everything we do, which is to engage right from the start and capture the learner's attention right at the start. Because if you capture their attention then and there, then you can hold that for the whole lesson, for the whole time you have them there, and you can input language and you can you can make learning happen. Um, but if you you know if you start off with something boring, then you, you're you're lost right at the beginning. So other production points, um, you know, editing things when we're putting things together, you know, make stuff. Uh, don't make don't make things too long. Make them as short as they can be, but whilst getting the point across, you know, make your point quickly. Um, with post production, which is things like animations and visual tricks, um, you know, we use that whenever we can. Um, but you know, ultimately, we this is we're working in education, so we don't have. You know, corporate budgets or anything like that, which is, uh, of course, no disrespect to the wonderful people at One Stop English who pay, who pay for us. But you know, this is this isn't Hollywood, so there's only a certain amount we can do. It's important that the content and the language and what we're actually filming, that's the thing that is key. So we also focus on and think carefully about who is going to be using the resources. So if we're making a series that we're aiming for for teenage learners, then we've got to be Making it relevant to teenage learners as much as possible, um, and with music and sound effects, which we try and use as much as possible. So we we try to use uh, appropriate sounds for whatever it is we're making, and and once again make them engaging, make them interesting. Choose something that fits, um, and you know never ever use that horrible royalty-free music that you get that sounds like it was made by someone with an, a, you know, a cheap MIDI keyboard um, and it's just awful and cheesy. So avoid any music like that, absolutely. Um, now, next I would like to play you a couple of audio clips. So they are from uh, an episode of uh, A Time to Travel, which is one of the series we've uh, made for One Stop. Um, and it's called Knights of the Round Table, um, which is uh, my favourite episode. It's brilliant. Um, if you haven't ever done it, do have a look at it. Um, so just briefly setting the scene, but it's it's a retelling of the tale of King Arthur and Merlin and Excalibur, which you may have come across. It's sort of classic uh, English folklore. And we've got uh, our heroine, our character Amber Adams. And she has just figured out a way of helping Merlin, the great wizard, escape from this magic prison he's been trapped in, that the evil sorceress Morgana has trapped him in there. So she frees him from the prison, um, and then he uses his magic, he uses his magic to help King Arthur um, defeat the evil sorceress and defeat the dragon. Um, I need to explain a little bit about it, because otherwise it might not make that much sense. So hopefully... This will make sense. Now, uh, Henry is hopefully there, and he's about to play the audio for you. Drazu! Merlin, you're free! Amber, you saved me. It's time to end this game, Morgana. I'm coming for you. Anna Dothrok, Uthra Diende. Anna Dothrok, Uthra Diende. No! This cannot happen! Ah! Merlin, cast a spell to freeze the dragon. Anadathrak. Now, Arthur, cut off its head. Victory! We did it! I can't believe it. We actually did it! So... There you go, that was a clip without any music or sound effects on. It may not have made too much sense. Um, was anyone else getting a delay on that when it, the sound was doubled? Um, because that wasn't supposed to be there and 
made me slightly confused. Yeah. Um, yes. Henry. <laughs> um, no, there wasn't supposed to be any video. It was just that was just audio. Um, the next clip, which is the same clip with uh, music and sound effects, if it's doubled as well, will sound pretty crazy, Henry. So I don't know. Uh, it may be something to do with my speakers being on, James. Oh, do you think maybe it was maybe playing it was back? back through, it was probably playing back through through me. I think. I think. Um, can you turn your speakers off for a second, and then yes, Henry, we can play the second clip. It's not my speakers because I've got um, uh, I've already got coming to the headset. Anyway, this isn't the second clip. And I hope it works. Razu! Merlin, you're free. Amber. You saved me! It's time to end this game, Morgana. I'm coming for you. Anna Dothrok, Uthra Diende. Anna Dothrok, Uthra Diende. No! This cannot happen! Merlin, cast a spell to freeze the dragon. Anadathrak. No, Arthur! Cut off its head! Victory! Victory! <laughs> we did it! I can't believe it! We actually did it! Okay, so there you go. Um... That's, that's that's a lot of fun. Uh, now, what I hope you notice is that, for a start, it should have made sense with the sounds um, because you can hear what's happening. Um, it also, it really doesn't work without the sound design, and the music. Now, uh, one of the main reasons I wanted to play that was to show how, when you're working with uh, audio, with sound, and with music, you can bring that back into the writing. So, when you're writing a script for something like that. You don't need to have all these extra descriptive words. Uh, you can, you know, otherwise you'd be, you know, Arthur picks up his sword, stands over the dragon, cuts the sword, cuts, using his, using his sword, he cuts the head off the dragon, which then rolls down the hill or, or whatever it does. You don't have to have any of that language in because you're using sound to do that, which means you can use, have less key language in there, and so you can use that key language um, more accurately when you're working with the learning side of things. Um, admittedly, that clip wasn't the best example of that, but that clip was a good example of how much fun you can have with the audio. Um, and it all comes back to our original aims of you know, engaging and capturing the listener's attention. Um, if you make something fun, make something interesting, then hopefully people will listen. <coughs> and um, at the end of the day, you know, for Luke and myself, when we can, we try to make resources that we'd like to listen to and we'd like to watch. Because if it doesn't capture our attention and we're not interested in it, then we can't expect anyone else to be. So that's it for audio now. I'm just going to talk a little bit about our Live from London uh, video uh, series, which is, I think there's two or three episodes out now on one stop, and there's a few more to come. Um, and then Sarah's Luke's going to take put, Sarah's just put, nicely put a link in for us on the, in the Everyone chat room. OK, that's the link to Time to Travel. At, at the, uh, we'll put all the links up to everything at the end as well, so don't worry if you don't catch that right now. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk a bit about the Live from London series, then Luke's going to talk about a, a load of the educational side of stuff. Um, so we made the decision to record in Brixton, which is in south of London. Um, and uh, Brixton's an amazing area. It's one of the most multicultural places in the world. It really is. You've got, it's not big, it's a small area, and in that area, you've got people representing almost every country in the world, almost every color, shape, and size, almost every religion. There's, there's this big melting pot of people all in the same place, all living uh, together. And, uh, and as a result, it's a very vibrant place. So, but also, it's, quite a, it's a bit of an edgy place. We didn't quite know what we were going to get. So, um, so we turned up you know, with a camera and a microphone, with a few people. Um, and when you go out on the street to interview people with no real plan, apart from a few questions, you have to get lucky. 
you need a little bit of luck with who you bump into. And we did manage to get really, really lucky on the day. We met some, we met all sorts of wonderful characters. And in a moment, we'll watch a clip uh, by a woman called Lorraine, who was brilliant. Um, and Luke was, Luke's going to talk about her. Um, um, who just approached us. She's like, oh, you got a camera? Hello. And starts chatting. Was, that's the sort of character you get in Brixton. Um, so our, our a approach with the production of the videos, just briefly, was we wanted to make short videos with uh, short sections of interview. So just get the really good stuff. You know, also ideal for people with short attention spans like, uh, like teenagers and perhaps the, the staff at One Stop English. Um, there you go, that's my second joke. That's both my jokes done. No more jokes now. Thanks, Luke, smiling. He's smiling because he's, he's like, oh, gosh. You weren't going to do that. You didn't do that in the run-through. Um, <laughs> so, moving on. We wanted to make the opening montages of the videos. Um, and montages are when you've got lots of uh, sh short video scenes happening quickly, like in Rocky when he's training for a fight or something like that. So we wanted to use colourful shots of um, Brixton markets um, to show how the, the wonderful diversity you get there. Um, we wanted to include the interviewees' names on the screen, so you can see that you can see who they are to help you connect with them a little bit. And um, because these are real people, we interview real people with real lives. Um, and what I think the Live from London series does brilliantly is authenticity. It's you know they're real; these are real Londoners. You don't get this experience from wandering around, wandering around Buckingham Palace or around Oxford Street. Uh, you know, these are just normal people with wonderfully diverse lives, and uh, and for me, that's a real treat. Um, wouldn't you agree with that, Luke? I would. And carrying on with this idea of authenticity um, about the videos. Yeah. So compared with the inauthentic listening material, uh, authentic listening material will have the advantage of exposing students to real language. Um, language used in, in real life. So we're going to take Lorraine, one of the interviewees, as James mentioned, she just kind of approached us. Because on the day we spent a lot of time stopping people and saying, hey, would you mind if we asked you a few questions? Um, and again, I mean, lots of people were very receptive, but this lady was particularly receptive because she approached us. Um, and we're going to use her as a great example and some of the, some of the, the language that she used um, for authentic um, authentic listening. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to play a video clip. I'm not going to tell you anything more about Lorraine. Um, we're just going to watch the video clip. Uh, and I want you to just as a viewer and listener, just, just to think about the way that she speaks. And then I'll talk about it afterwards. So we are going to put the clip up, which I think Henry is doing now, in the chat box. Because it's better for you to watch it on YouTube. Um, so if you watch this any time in the next few seconds, We'll give you a minute to watch it. It's only a short clip. So watch it, take your time, and then we'll be back. Is that a minute? I'm counting. Is that giving people enough time, do you think, James? Hopefully people are saying they've done it. Yeah, well, thank you, Elizabeth. And Sarah Minigan has, yes, yes, so we'll carry on. So as you can see from Lorraine's um, clip, her language is, um, is very natural, and it certainly isn't graded. Graded is a process as writers that we go through um, when we are scripting um, mainly listening material, but also with video as well. Um, so when you grade language, you you, um, uh, you take away, um, well, first of all, you, you take away um, uh, low frequency words, um, depending on level. Um, and you also take away kind of um, natural speech and utterances, which we're going to look at. So the pace in which she speaks is also very natural. She's speaking at her own, own speed. She's not aware of who's going to be watching the videos. Um, and her responses are, uh, are very authentic. And I think if the case is we are 
as teachers we're, we're preparing our learners for the real world um, then this kind of exposure if you're not in a native speaking country um, is vital really um, so we're going to have a look at the transcript and a little bit more detail of her language so let's have a look at this uh, so I'll give you a little bit of time to read through it. Well, maybe I'll read through it with you. So um, we're reading it together. So, oh God, uh, this was quite a long time ago. I think I was actually, it was actually a Spice Girls concert where I actually met her. Yeah, I suppose it was just really her personality that really, yeah, that really made me take to her more than sort of anything else. Because before I was introduced to her, I didn't know anything about her. So it's just really her personality, you know? And you know when you find you have things in common, the same likes, it's just kind of easy then to develop a friendship from there because obviously you just share that shared interest. So that's the way that she speaks. Um, if we were, if I was a voiceover actor and I was recording an EFL listening material piece, I wouldn't find a script like that. It's very unlikely. Um, so let's have a little bit. There's a few list of things that come out in, 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 in this transcript which are quite interesting to look at and think about and consider. So tautology, which is the idea that we do in our own language, um, very naturally, we, we, say, we have a habit of saying the same thing twice over in different words, especially when someone is looking and responding to you and you're thinking perhaps they didn't hear you or they didn't fully understand you or catch the gist of what you're saying. You have a tendency to repeat yourself. So she's doing that, as you can see, kind of constantly throughout this little bit of, this little bit of transcript. There's lots of hesitation ums and ers and wells and hmm and uh, mm. transcribing all of the live from london uh um, videos um takes time because you're trying i'm i'm trying to include all of those utterances um in the transcript sorry that was an email of mine coming through um lots of repetition you can see that she's kind of saying really a lot um and actually which we all do, all, 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 all um, native speakers of English do, and, and non-native speakers of English do as well. It's not just specifically for native and um, native speakers. Um, there's a, I'm just saying, I'm, as I'm speaking, I'm doing lots of, I, I'm, I'm famous for my ums, ums. In fact, when I listen to my voice back, I can't believe how many, time I, how many times I say um. So we've also got, a, there's a lot of abbreviations that she's using, things like cos, which we all do, which is short, obviously, for because. Um, other examples in the Live from London videos is uni, um, at, at which is university, and obviously a very common one. And James, you can have a little sip now if you want, just to fit with uh, fit, fit, fit visually. Yeah, how many is that? James is drinking a cuppa. Uh, it's cold now, which is a cup of tea, which is an abbreviation for actually a, um, actually a, a, almost a phrase or a, multiple words. Um, and then there's lots of fillers, lovely cuppa, Sarah Milligan, thank you. And then there's lots of fillers, um, which is also very common in, in all the videos. You know, you know, oh God, sort of. If you if you speak to an English teenager, um, you'll hear them saying the word like all the time. So like, I went down and I met my friend like, and it was like really fun and like, <laughs> like, 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 almost to the point where there's so many likes that if you phase out whilst listening to them, all you can really hear is like. Um, which can be a little bit irritating. Um, uh, but teenagers, as we know, I'm not sure most of you have taught them before, can be irritating, um, but also very interesting as well at the same time. And there's also spoken discourse markers, um, which things like obviously and basically, uh, literally as well, um, we say, and we often use it in the wrong way, but it, the meaning has changed over time. But these words like obviously, basically, we, people just throw it in. They throw it into their speech without really considering whether it's correct to do so or not. So there's a lot of that. So this kind of language is really, it's really important, I think, for our students to be, to, 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 to build an awareness of the way that we speak. Um, it's gonna help them in the real world. So what I thought we'd do now is being aware of this, or um, having looked at this in more detail, let's watch the video. Um, so if you follow the link to the video, let's watch it for a second time and see how that changes the experience of viewing it. So. I'll give everyone a, another opportunity for a minute to, to watch that. I'm slightly concerned about time. I'll move fast.
If anyone could let me know when they're done, that would be great. They probably can't. Oh yeah, you can hear me. You can hear both. Yeah. Sarah Milligan's done. Sarah Milligan's so fast. Rachel Slatter's done. Okay, let's move on now to um, another aspect of the Live from London videos and the language that comes out is idiomatic and colloquial expressions um, that arise all the time. And unlike traditional course books that might place idioms into workable categories, in natural flowing speech, things aren't so orderly. Um, so we're going to set up a couple of polls, which I believe um, Henry's going to do. Um, uh, just two, two idioms that came from the Live from London uh, videos. Um, so you, you, you got poll one and poll two. Uh, the poll one is in your face, and you've got three possible definitions for in your face can mean. A, it's impossible to ignore or avoid. B, an expression that reveals your true feelings. C, it's a secret. And to be blown away, to be amazed by something or to be distracted by something or to be pushed away by somebody. So have a go. See how you do. Um, so in choosing Brixton to make our videos, we, we knew that we'd encounter a, a rich, diverse mix of interviewees. So there's lots of range of nationalities and accents, um, regional accents as well, not just people from London that are, that are English. And in many ways, it's a kind of microcosm of the real world. Um, so as a teacher, finding authentic listening uh, is, a, is, is tricky. Um, it's important. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of material available. Uh, you've got YouTube videos, online news channels, uh, films, TV shows, um, but they all require quite a lot of groundwork uh, um, from a teacher. Um, sometimes they're too long, these videos, or um, you might need to sort of cut them up. Uh, but what we wanted to do with Live from London was to kind of give it all to you ready-made. Um, so we made the, uh, the videos short and concise. Also, the questions that we asked the people on the streets were very personal, and that's a great way of getting people to talk when they're talking about themselves. Um, and each video comes with seven teaching tips rather than a detailed manuscripted lesson plan. Uh, we didn't want to create anything too prescriptive, um, so to encourage teachers to interpret and exploit and, and exploit the videos as they wish. Um, and most of the tips in the series can be put into practice with any video. So let's just have a quick look at the next slide. And I'll just give you a, just a few examples um, of, is that the right slide? Yeah. Okay, so let's just go through them quickly. So one way of engaging students when it comes to showing them a video, a short, a short, short video perhaps from YouTube, is you can turn the sound off, get them to look at the way people are interacting with each other, and they then can make um, predictions as to what the content might be or what people are, what people are saying. Uh, it's quite an obvious one, and then you can obviously play it back with the sound on, and, and they can see how close they were. Um, it's actually quite good. It works really well. It, you can often tell quite a lot just from the way that people are expressing themselves. Um, and then you can do the opposite. You can listen to it with only sound, and then the students can make predictions about you know, who's speaking, um, what that person may look like. That's quite a good warmer. It's quite a good engaging exercise to get them interested and then watching. It's always good if in any way that you can get them thinking and making any kind of predictions as to what's going on and then playing it. It's a, it's a, it's a very engaging way of using video. Um, and I'm going to mention a, a friend of ours um, soon who does a lot of that with some of his lessons on his website. Um, you can do a reordering task. So you get the clip, you transcribe the clip, uh, you cut it up into uh, uh, a, the wrong order, hand it out to the students, they watch the video, or sorry, you watch the video first and they have to put it back into order. Um, and that's a great way of them looking at language directly. A little exercise to get them putting it in the right order and then you'll get natural, a natural flow of questions. What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? It's in, they're engaged in their own way. You're not having to force feed the language. Uh, you can do true or false questions. Uh, so you have to watch the video yourself. Write your own true or false questions. Get them to watch the video. Or even perhaps do the true or false questions before if it's, if it's possible. And then they can watch the video to check their answers. Or if the uh, content isn't, doesn't make that possible, they watch the video and then do the true or, question, true or false questions after watching the video. 
a theme discussion, uh, whatever the content may be about. Um, in the case of Life from London, they're all very personal subjects, talking about love, Christmas, um, friends, um, pretty basic subjects that everyone can talk about. So there's a lot of theme discussion tips of how to use that in, in, in the series. You can do that with any video that you choose. Uh, reconstruction, again, it's a little bit like those who've done Dictogloss. You might play the video a couple of times and then put the students into small groups and get them to reconstruct what they've seen and maybe to write out some bullet points or to, re or to write, out, write out a whole script of what they've seen. Uh, and then vocabulary, of course. Vocabulary is a great opportunity to extract any vocabulary that you think is good from the videos. Um, and you can do that in many, many ways. You can pre-teach that vocabulary by getting people to match definitions to words. Uh, you can um, hand out the words and get students to work in small groups and think about what they might mean. Or you can do it all after watching the video as well. There's many options. But there's always good vocabulary that comes out. So. Yeah, I hope you can use those, I and mean, they're all part of the series as well. So if you go and use a the series, there'll be many more examples and tips that you can then translate and use with any other videos that you may choose to bring to your classroom. So some useful websites in the next slide, if you can go to the next slide. Fill in always works wonders. Yeah, I agree, Elizabeth, it's a good, good idea as well. Yeah, you can write the sentences with a gap get students to fill in the gaps with the words, correct words. So useful websites, um, lessonstream.com, um, which is run by our friend Jamie Keddy, who's a very inspiring uh, teacher and presenter and writer. And on this website that you can go to, they have ready-made lesson plans around sort of interesting and unusual YouTube videos and, and lots more as well. Uh, so um, we, we recommend that website. Um, you'll also find, I hopefully find on that website, a video that we made with him in the summer um, or on his YouTube. If you go to Jamie Keddy, you can find some videos on his YouTube channel. Um, there's also Film English, which is more based on short films and feature films, uh, which has ready-made lesson plans and just good to go to. I mean, if you the thing about these websites is you may go and use a lesson uh, which has the video um, embedded in the lesson, and that will give you lots of ideas of how to use, then you can go and choose and select your own videos uh, and do this, you know, do a similar thing or use a similar approach. Um, Film English is great from Nabla. Yeah, it is good, isn't it? I agree, Nabla. Um, so then there's a Sandy Millen blog. Um, Sandy Millen is a EFL blogger and writer. Uh, and there's a link there and it's a really useful link. She's got lots of, lots of YouTube videos that explore a different vari um, a variety of British accents. Um, so have a look at that blog, it's really good, um, and you can um, expose your students to a very quick story. I remember having a student who was very, very confident, a South Korean student in my class many years ago, and he was kind of top, you know, one of the most confident, and his level of English was probably the best in the class. He was about to move to advanced level. He was an upper intermediate student, very conscientious, very hardworking, obsessed with Liverpool Football Club, uh, and he went to Liverpool and uh, came back like white in the face, um, sort of shell-shocked and sort of dejected. And I was like, what happened? And he was like, I didn't understand anything. I got out at the main station and started asking for directions and getting some help from people. And I came across, a, which is a Liverpoolian accent, which is colloquially known as a Scouse accent, which is, um, James, can you do it? No, you probably can't. Um, it's just like they talk like that, and it's great, and they talk like that in Liverpool. If you get a really strong accent like that, you're going to have no idea at all about what people are saying to you. So it's quite good to sort of prepare yourself for that reality. Luckily, um, Liverpool people, uh, Liverpool people, people from Liverpool often stay in Liverpool. Um, you don't see it, you don't hear that accent that much in London, surprisingly, or at least people have been here in a long enough time. What tends to happen to people with regional accents in England when they come to London, where I live, is their accent sort of gets, um, what's the word, James? Softened. Um, softened, yeah, softened over time. And that's probably because we're, in this country still, we're probably a little bit, um, it's a, still a little bit of a weird prejudice towards a northern accent. Or I know from friends of mine that come from the north that live in London, they don't feel that comfortable with their accent, which I think we need to change. Um, so yeah, go to, that, go, to that, go to that blog and change it, start changing it. Uh, next slide, 
slide nine will go to because we're really running over time. Um, what about the screen. poll? When are you going to do the... Oh, the poll will do at the end, James. We'll do it at the end. Okay. Um, so, some links for you. A uh, link to the Live from London series, which I'm talking about. Uh, the next link is uh, Time to Travel. James played a clip, an audio clip example of that. And then if you want to go a bit further back down the archives, um, there's a link to A Ghost Guide to London, which is uh, similar in a way to Time to Travel. Very different content, but it's a cinematic listening experience um, full of lots of sound effects. And it's all about a ghost and his experiences in London. Also, you get to quite a variety of accents as well in that. Uh, and there's also a link to our website, me and James's website, Creative Listening, uh, where you can follow us on Facebook if you like. Um, and we, yeah. <laughs> um, let's go and have a look at the polls, shall we? Not the um, let's see how we've done. I think I think it was, I think I think everyone's done really well. So I think we're all so very good. So in your face, yeah, in your face. Yeah, something that's in your face is impossible to ignore. I think everyone's correct. I think I made this quite easy by ax by giving option one as the correct answer. <laughs> uh, yeah. Amateur. Um, do we? Oh, someone's changed it. Oh, someone's. Do you click on end poll? Is that right, Macmillan people? Probably. Oh, there you go. It shows the results because we don't see the res I don't see the results. Um, in your face, an expression that reveals your true feelings uh, is 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 um, is incorrect. <laughs> um, in your face, so an example of something that's in your face, James, would be perhaps people are, people sometimes talk about describe New York City as in your face, um, just because of the intensity of it and the vibrancy of it. So you could, or that would be a place or a person who's in your face who just won't, who's um, very loud and brash, and you know. Well, uh, my my six-year-old daughter at six o'clock in the morning when she yes. wants me to get up and make her breakfast and she's like, Daddy, I'm hungry. I'm, I, I'm asleep. I am asleep. I don't care if you're hungry. It's a bit That's, in your face. You know, Although, in my face. It, yeah, it, it has relatively negative connotations. If someone's in your face, it can be quite negative. Um, so be careful how you use it. Um, and then, of course, to be blown away, everyone got that right. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not surprised. They're all English teachers online, surely, so... Uh, to be blown away, to be amazed by something, yeah, you, you might go to the cinema or, um, or a better example would be to go and see a live music concert that's just amazing and, it, you, you know, you get blown away. Me and James saw a gig um, earlier, well, last year, Sufjan Stevens' concert in Brighton. And we were both uh, definitely blown away by it. It was pretty amazing. So well done. Everyone's done quite well. There are, if you go back, if you go to the series, there's lots of idioms that pop up. So you can enjoy and learn some more. So Ghost Guide to London's full of idioms. We yeah, did a lot on that series. Yeah, every lesson on that series is full of idioms, yeah. So just like to say a, a, a genuine and really big thank you to One Stop English um, because uh, we've had a great relationship with them for a good few years now and they've supported us right at the start. They took a risk with the Ghost Guide to London, um, which was unlike anything that had been put out there at all at that time and um, and they're all great people and they um, with Life London as well Sarah Midigan was you know she was the mastermind behind that so I mean you can't take too much of the credit um, and uh, she's great they're all great so thank you yeah uh, yeah yeah I'll reiterate that and uh, yeah we because I know no, actually <laughs> yeah I'm so, mm. Mm, had a few issues with um, one stop in this really um, <laughs> No, the great the great thing about One Stop English is, is, that, is that they have the opportunity to um, to really be a bit more experimental with some of the material that they put out. There's less risk, um, but it's a great it's a great opportunity for us to, tr to kind of try things a little bit. And hopefully, the idea of um, authentic listening and, and video content and um, cinematic listening and it, playing with these things will, is going to kind of start becoming more an integral part of all the EFL material. Um, so yeah, thanks to One Stop for giving us a kind of starting point in that. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Questions? Isn't it James? Do we have any questions? Any questions? Are we doing questions? We can do questions. Sorry, we, People aren't. We probably covered everything so wonderfully. There's no questions. Middle education. When, when, when are you going to stop talking? <laughs> okay, a couple of minutes. So any questions you've got?
Maggie. Thank you all for coming to listen to us as yeah, well. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much appreciated. Maggie's asking a question. Or just maybe she's just saying thanks. Uh, oh, thank you, Maggie. 